Uh, I remember very vaguely. It was first symphony. And of course I remembered being obviously a very, very young man. I remember this final moment when the horn section suddenly stands and continues to play while standing. A very, very powerful statement, last in this symphony. That's, that was very memorable and I don't think it's my favorite episode right now of all symphonies that I composed, but it was the first one I remember. Well, he was twice in St. Petersburg <clears throat> and uh, he conducted music of other composers, especially Beethoven, but also he conducted his own Fifth Symphony. You cannot maybe compare... You know, he, it seems he was extremely impressed with orchestra and uh, his words are known. He found a fantastic orchestra, he found a very uh, strong response and very good reception here. There, and obviously he came to St. Petersburg, he was a happy man. Uh, it was not an unhappy period of his life. I certainly feel much more protected when I go with all my experience with Shostakovich and look at another score. I hear certain things which maybe people do not find immediately. And it's not in the, what interval or in which tonality, it's, 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 it's the intensity and uh, the musical, the, the way the music tries to express um, what is so much in your heart or in your mind, and then there is a way musically you can do it, that you speak out, you know. And this is where Shostakovich and Mahler are, I think, in some ways similar. Of course, Shostakovich is a, someone who follows, is someone who hears, his, you know, if not mentor, but certainly his big predecessor. I very much believe Shostakovich both was very Russian composer, but he couldn't avoid and maybe didn't want to avoid uh, the, the, the most fundamental uh, emotional power he was given by Mahler and his cycle. Maybe Shostakovich didn't want to go away from it. He knew that this is a great statement and this is the, what, we, you, what you sometimes call as like an Everest, you know. I think Mahler is respected in Russia and we contribute, I, I do it with Marinsky more than any other conductor in orchestra. In Russia we played maybe in 10 cities. It's a big number because you talk about cities, some of those cities are a million and a half or two million people or about a million people living there. So. Um, you know, the visit of Marinsky Orchestra, which is maybe today more famous orchestra from Russia worldwide, it's quite well known. And uh, if we play, you no, know, we played, for example, in Kazan, Eighth Symphony, Eighth Symphony, and we used the chorus, not only our chorus, but also local chorus, it was a massive event. And it was, it was great to see how many young players and musicians were there. Practically, what you call hanging on the luster, you know. Mahler was a great conductor, so he made it very difficult or nearly impossible for conductor to bring his own personality and uh, to take just like a white list of paper, you know, and, and just start to improvise. It's so punctual, so clear what he wants. It is near to impossible to go away from it. It is something what especially, actually you feel especially when you inside any symphony matter, practically all of them have what you call this, the noise of the city, the chaos, 
there is the word urbanistic. Ur, 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 urbanistic, it's just like you're in the middle of the city, there's all these cars. And even then, maybe, especially before First World War, the feeling of catastrophe coming was stronger and stronger and stronger. And Meyer didn't live. Uh, maybe he could give us something shockingly different, even to his last adagio of the 10th symphony, if he lived another five years. I recently conducted 10th symphony, and I spent much time trying to understand, or it's not the word to understand, trying to make it sound uh, like a piece of music composed by, although a composer who was mysteriously approaching his last month's death, his death was what you call next door. But I, I'm trying to perform this uh, music still with a, a big, big effort to make that, if not laughing, but maybe sometimes composer is smiling. If not, uh, if not completely hopeful, but somewhat hopeful music. You see the difference between completely hopeless and somewhat hopeful. And Mahler, if he was uh, writing his autobiography, if he lived another 10, 15 years, maybe would give us explanations and would make it much easier for people to understand why he composed this, in many ways, strange adagio. But strange it was, but then the music of Berg or Webern or Schoenberg and, and many others, you know, makes it sound like a first statement of maybe New Venice school, rather than you wait until Schoenberg theoretically explains what is New Venice school, what is the technique of composition, where you don't have a tonality and so on, all music. So we are still not totally clear on this, and I think uh, this radio should sound like yet another statement about human life, the nature, and this huge musical world where you constantly want to progress. Well, I would, I would certainly ask him to conduct for us, uh, and, uh, if possible, at least one of his symphonies. And I certainly wouldn't miss this if he was in a position to agree. When, when I look, uh, you see the score of Symphony of Mahler, I just have to continue to ask myself why, why, look, there are many, many things, but why he says crafty, okay, it's clear, it has to be kind of powerful, uh, he will warn you not too fast, or then he will warn you uh, don't drag the, the, the schleppen, which means that you just don't make public feel that they are given a sleeping pill. You know? uh, so these are very famous remarks of Mahler, everyone knows about them. But to call a certain movements of certain symphonies, to give them an indication, like I described Ronda Finale, is maybe what we sometimes we don't think very much about it. We think if it's Finale. But Ronda Finale is something else. Conductor has to find a way to let music breathe and uh, maybe make these kind of statements most powerful and very often it even screams. You know? yeah. uh, one has to take sometimes your own um, energy into very controlled you know, uh, and very in a way, in a way, reserved the manner rather than you, you sweat, you know, and uh, people suffer. He 
was men who was sometimes so far above the routine that famously some of musicians, especially in New York, they simply didn't understand. Being a gigantic musician, he was telling them, obviously, that that was the highest uh, caliber of uh, music making, and, and he, if anyone he could explain or demand from any orchestra in the world certain things where the quality was supposed to be just higher and higher and higher, because there is no doubt he knew uh, everything about you know any instrument orchestration and so on. But the truth was that very experienced musicians. I just conducted New York Philharmonic, uh, which is of course now 100% changed, totally different. But they're a wonderful orchestra, they can play anything and so on. But he had trouble just to be understood, and some of them in a very uncomfortable way, maybe even maybe a rude way. They would just make it known that they don't understand what the conductor is talking about. It is enough, even if you conduct Symphony of Beethoven, and you see that some someone on stage doesn't understand your intentions, your colleagues. But if it's also it's going on with your own music, not understood, not supported, and was, you know, it could be, in, in the best case, ironic, but in, in the worst case, it could be aggressive against his compositions and against him. So that's, of course, uh, very, uh, maybe very strongly influenced his early 